My name is Adam Swanepoel and today I'll be speaking about the complications of preeclampsia. What is preeclampsia? It's a multi-system progressive disorder seen in the second half of pregnancy. According to the International Society for the Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy, Preeclampsia is defined as new onset hypertension after 20 weeks gestational age with or without proteinuria and or with or without end organ dysfunction. So why is preeclampsia important? The prevalence is about 2 to 8 percent of all pregnancies worldwide. It's an important cause of both maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. The Saving Mothers report in 2017 showed a decrease in mortality rate due to non-pregnancy related infections and obstetric hemorrhage, but a slight increase in preventable deaths from hypertensive disorders when comparing 2009 to 2017. In 2017, 20% of preventable maternal deaths were related to hypertensive disorders and their complications. The complications of preeclampsia often represent the severe features of the disease spectrum and are often the presenting complaint. 10% of patients will develop symptoms before 34 weeks, about 5% postpartum, and the remaining will present after 34 weeks. In order to understand the complications of preeclampsia, it helps if you understand a bit of the pathophysiology. So it involves both maternal and fetal factors, and it's due to abnormalities in placental vasculature development in early pregnancy. So relative placental underperfusion, hypoxia and ischemia causes the release of anti-angiogenic factors into the maternal circulation which alter the maternal systemic endothelial function, which leads to hypertension and other manifestations of the disease. The trigger for the abnormal placentation remains unknown, but certain risk factors have been identified. The complications can be divided according to the systems, as preeclampsia affects almost every organ system. The severe features often represent an indication for delivery and include uncontrolled blood pressures, eclampsia, cerebral or visual complications, pulmonary edema, platelets of less than 100 or HALT syndrome, a creatinine of more than 90, significant proteinuria, ascites and a rupture placenta. A summary of the complications can be seen on the table on the right hand side but we will be going through some of them in a little bit more detail but the main systems involved are neurological, respiratory, renal, GIT, hematological, placental and fetal complications and then long-term complications for both mother and fetus. We'll start off with the neurological complications. The one we all know very well is eclampsia. And then there is posterior reversible leukoencephalopathy, also known as PRESS, visual symptoms, stroke. Headache in itself only points to underlying pathology, but is not a complication in itself. Eclampsia is new onset generalized tonic clonic seizures or coma in a woman with preeclampsia. It's the convulsive manifestation of preeclampsia. It occurs in about 1 in 50 women with preeclampsia and severe features, and 1 in 400 women with preeclampsia without severe features. 59% of eclampsia occurs antepartum. 20% intrapartum and 21% postpartum. 90% of postpartum cases occur within the first week. The exact mechanism of seizures are unknown, but two proposed models have been identified. The first one is the breakdown of cerebral autoregulatory system, 
which leads to hyperperfusion of cerebral vasculature, which leads to further endothelial dysfunction and vasogenic and cytotoxic cerebral edema. The second is that hypertension activates the cerebral autoregulatory system, which leads to vasoconstriction of the cerebral vessels and then to hypoperfusion and localized ischemia, endothelial dysfunction, and cerebral edema. Mm -hmm. The clinical presentation of eclampsia varies between patients, but we often identify the imminent eclampsia symptoms, which includes acute severe hypertension or loss of blood pressure control in 75% of cases, headache 66% of cases, visual disturbances in 27% of cases, right upper quadrant pain or epigastric pain in 25% and 25% of patients are often asymptomatic prior to the eclamptic fit. The fetal response to eclampsia includes an initial fetal bradycardia lasting about 3 to 5 minutes on the CTG during and immediately after the seizure and this is due to hypoxia. After the resolution of the seizure, the fetal tachycardia is often seen with or without loss of variability. But this improves on maternal and fetal resuscitation in the absence of an abrupt show. Race is often associated with eclampsia and it is a clinical radiological syndrome of different etiologies grouped together due to similar findings on neuroimaging. It refers to reversible vasogenic brain edema of mainly the bilateral parietal occipital areas accompanied with acute neurological symptoms, for example seizures, decreased consciousness and visual disturbances. Therefore it was hypothesized that patients with preeclampsia and eclampsia and neurological symptoms have a similar pathophysiology. On a review, 90% of patients with eclampsia showed features of press, and 20% of patients with preeclampsia showed features of press. Visual symptoms also represent a severe end of the spectrum of the disease. The symptoms are caused in part due to retinal arteriolar spasm, but could also be manifestations of press. Symptoms include blurred vision, photopsia, which is flashing lights or sparks, scotomata, which is dark areas or gaps in the visual fields, diplopia, cortical blindness is rare and typically transient but could be due to retinal artery or vein occlusion, retinal detachment, optic nerve damage or retinal artery spasm. In 2012 a study was done at Tigerberg Hospital and looked at macular changes seen in patients with severe preeclampsia using optical coherent tomography. The results showed a positive correlation between increased central retinal thickness and increasing proteinuria. There was no significant correlation found between blood pressure and any of the retinal parameters. Two of the patients involved developed serous retinal detachments, both of which resolved completely postpartum. Stroke remains one of the serious complications that can lead to death and disability. 36% of strokes in pregnancy are preeclampsia or eclampsia related. Most strokes in this setting are hemorrhagic but can be ischemic. The symptoms preceding stroke are often severe headache and severely elevated and fluctuating blood pressures. Eclamptic seizures only occur in some but not all cases. Lowering of blood pressure with antihypertensives reduces the risk of stroke. That concludes the neurological complications. With regards to respiratory complications, the main complication is pulmonary edema as demonstrated on the chest x-ray.
Pulmonary edema occurs in about 10% of preeclampsia patients and is a feature of the severe end of the spectrum of the disease. The symptom complex seen is usually dyspnea, chest pain and or decreased saturation. Saturation of less than 93% is predictive of adverse maternal outcome, which includes death or other severe features that are likely to be present. The etiology is multifactorial but includes increased hydrostatic pressure in the pulmonary vasculature, decreased plasma oncotic pressure due to loss of protein and albumin, capillary leak, left heart failure, acute severe hypertension, and an important cause is iatrogenic fluid overload. Renal complications include proteinuria, decreased urine output, and acute kidney injury. Proteinuria occurs due to impaired integrity of the glomerular filtration barrier, an altered tubular handling of filtered proteins, which causes increased non-selective protein excretion, as well as deficient vascular endothelial growth factor signaling. Protein urea generally increases as preeclampsia progresses, and increased protein urea may be a late finding in preeclampsia. Preeclampsia causes intrarenal vasospasm that can lead to 25% decreased in GFR. Renal output in preeclampsia can decrease to less than 20 moles per hour and magnesium sulfate which is used to treat the preeclampsia can further decrease the output. Important to note that transient decreased output is common in normal labor and can be up to 25 moles per hour. Acute kidney injury is a common complication of preeclampsia. Normal physiological pregnancy changes leads to an increase in GFR, which leads to a lower serum creatinine levels and falls by an average of 35 moles per liter in pregnancy. Creatinine in preeclampsia gener generally remains in the normal non-pregnant range of 35 to 70 or only slightly increased. Creatinine levels more than 97 or more than twice the baseline level indicate severe end of the spectrum of disease. Levels rarely rise to more than 133, but preeclampsia is the most common cause of acute kidney injury in pregnancy. The gastrointestinal complications or manifestations of preeclampsia include epigastric pain, liver rupture or hemorrhage, and ascites. Epigastric pain is a cardinal symptom of severe disease. It's often described as severe constant pain, more often at night. Maximum is the, on the lower retrosternum or epigastrium and it may or may not be associated with nausea and vomiting. The liver may be tender due to stretching of the glisten capsule from hepatic swelling and hemorrhage. Liver capsule rupture or hemorrhage is a rare complication, but increased index of suspicion if sudden right upper quadrant pain with signs of hypervolemic shock are seen. Ascites is another common finding in women with preeclampsia, and the incidence is about 21% in women with preeclampsia and severe disease. The ascites is related due to the increased vascular permeability, which is due to the endothelial dysfunction and or hepatic dysfunction and or the hypoproteinemia. A 2017 study looked at 624 women with preeclampsia. So preeclampsia with ascites, it showed a 42% adverse maternal outcome, which included pulmonary edema, eclampsia, acute kidney injury, or DIC. And it showed a 36% adverse neonatal outcome, so intrauterine fetal death, neonatal death, and HIE.
preeclampsia without ascites showed a 9% adverse maternal outcome and a 17% adverse neonatal outcome. The conclusion of the study was that ascites in women with preeclampsia is an independent risk factor for adverse maternal outcome but not necessarily perinatal outcome. Hematological complications of preeclampsia include thrombocytopenia, HALP syndrome, and coagulation abnormalities. Thrombocytopenia is the most common coagulation abnormality in preeclampsia. Platelet counts of less than 150 occurred in 20% of preeclampsia patients, and platelet counts of less than 100 are considered severe end of spectrum of, of the disease. It occurs due to microangiopathic endothelial injury, which activates platelets and fibrin th thrombi in microvasculature, which accelerates platelet consumption. Immune factors also seem to play a role. HALP syndrome is characterized by hemolysis, which is evident by schistocytes and helmet cells on smear, elevated liver enzymes, and thrombocytopenia. It represents the severe feature of preeclampsia, but the relationship between HALP and preeclampsia is still controversial. 50 to 20 percent of patients with HALP do not have hypertension or proteinuria. HALP syndrome occurs in 0.1 to 1 percent of all pregnant patients and 1 to 2 percent of preeclampsia patients. Microangiopathy and activation of intravascular coagulation accounts for the findings in HALP which are platelets less than 100 with evidence of hemolysis on smear, ALT or AST more than 60 or more than twice the upper limit of normal, and LDH of more than 600. The maternal complications are often related to hemorrhage and the neonatal complications are often related to preterm delivery. Coagulation studies generally not affected by preeclampsia unless accompanied by a complication, for example, abrupto or severe thrombocytopenia, hemorrhage, or liver dysfunction. There are a few imitators of preeclampsia and HALP syndrome, one of which is acute fatty liver of pregnancy. So the similarities are that they often present in the third trimester, and the initial symptoms are very nonspecific for example, nausea, vomiting, headache, and malaise. Many patients have hypertension with or without proteinuria, and this is possibly due to coexistent preeclampsia, but hypertension is more common in health than in acute fatty liver. The initial management of acute fatty liver is similar to health, in other words, stabilize and deliver, but important to differentiate as acute fatty liver can rapidly cause liver failure, encephalopathy, and hypoglycemia. Serum fibrinogen is the most important lab test to differentiate between acute fatty liver and HALP syndrome. In acute fatty liver, fibrinogen levels less than 300 mg per deciliter is the rule. In HALP syndrome, levels are usually more than 300 unless accompanied by DIC, for example, due to abruptio or hemorrhage. Other findings in acute fatty liver are increased prothrombin time, increased activated partial thromboplastin time, severe hypoglycemia, and increased serum creatinine more than in, in seen in preeclampsia. The diagnosis is only confirmed by liver biopsy, but it's unnecessary as it does not change the management. Thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura is another imitator of HALP syndrome. The similarities are that they have both severe thrombocytopenia, severe anemia, and increased LDH, but levels are much higher in TTP compared to HALP. The differences are that 
ALT and AST are minimally elevated in TTP and the percentage of schistocytes on smear are a lot higher in TTP than in help and TTP often presents earlier in gestation. The distinction between the two are very important as plasma exchange is the treatment of choice and is life-saving in TTP but of no use in treatment of help. Hemolytic uremic syndrome can also be considered an imitator of preeclampsia and help. Pregnancy-related atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome is rare. It usually presents in the postpartum period and is triggered by complement-mediated disorder that is activated by pregnancy. The similarities are that they both have thrombocytopenia and hemolysis and the difference is that severe kidney injury is seen in patients with uremic syndrome and often require dialysis. Placental and fetal complications include abruptual placenta, intrauterine fetal death, intrauterine growth restriction, preterm delivery with preterm complications, and cerebral palsy. Abruptual is the partial or complete placental detachment prior to delivery after 20 weeks gestational age. Preeclampsia leads to placental ischemia, which increases the risk of abruptio. The incidence of abruptio is about 0.49 to 1.8% of all pregnancies, and less than 1% of preeclampsia patients without severe features, and about 3% of preeclampsia patients with severe features. The immediate cause is rupture of maternal vessels, which can be an artery or a vein, in decidua basalis, bleeding is rarely from the fetal placental vessels. The maternal complications due to abruptio include mortality, which is about 1%, and the morbidity is due to DIC, severe hemorrhage, renal failure, massive blood transfusions, and hysterectomy. The perinatal complications associated with abruptio include intrauterine fetal death and neonatal death related to prematurity, as the peak incidence of abruptio is between 24 to 27 weeks. Antipartum hemorrhage, not specifically abruptio, accounted for 22% of fresh stillborns, more than 500 grams in South Africa between 2003 and 2005. Intrauterine growth restriction occurs due to decreased uteroplacental blood flow. The incidence in preeclampsia is about 22% and is evident by a small for gestational age baby, oligohydramnios, and rising umbilical artery dopplers. It can be considered as placental end organ dysfunction and therefore part of diagnostic criteria of preeclampsia. The long-term complications for mother and baby include cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cerebral palsy. The American Heart Association considers a history of preeclampsia, or PIH, as a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. The future risk of morbidity and mortality is related to the severity of the preeclampsia, the gestational age at delivery, and the number of disease recurrences. A 2017 systematic review of 22 studies included more than 6 million women, of whom 258,000 had preeclampsia, showed women with preeclampsia were at higher risk of future cardiovascular disease. Heart failure with a relative risk of 4.19, coronary artery disease with a relative risk of 2.5, death from cardiovascular disease with a relative risk of 2.2, and stroke with a relative risk of 1.8. Preeclampsia is also a risk factor for cardiomyopathy, 
both peripartum and years after delivery. One study showed that more than 11% of cardiomyopathy cases were in women with a history of previous preeclampsia or PIH. With regards to future diabetes risk, preeclampsia and PIH in the absence of GDM was associated with a two-fold increase in incidence of diabetes at 16 and a half years of follow-up. Preeclampsia or PIH with GDM had a 16 to 18 fold increase in incidence and GDM only had a 13 fold increase. A 2016 study that included more than 200,000 women showed the rate of CP more than doubled in patients with preeclampsia compared to normal tensive group. It showed that early onset preeclampsia small for gestational age or IUGR, neonatal sepsis, birth asphyxia and prematurity complications were all independent risk factors for cerebral palsy. And this supports the multi-hit model in the pathogenesis of CP. In summary, preeclampsia can affect both the mom and the baby. With regards to maternal complications, we can think about it in the different organ systems. With the central nervous system, it's mostly eclampsia, stroke and visual disturbances. Respiratory, it's pulmonary edema. Renal, it's acute kidney injury. Hemorrhage is abruptio, thrombocytopenia, help and DIC. Ascites, is a poor prognostic factor for maternal outcome and then the long-term complications which is cardiovascular disease and diabetes. The perinatal complications include IUGR due to placental insufficiency, intrauterine fetal death due to abruptio or placental insufficiency and neonatal death which is usually prematurity related and cerebral palsy which is multifactorial in cause. Thank you for taking time to listen to my talk on the complications of preeclampsia. I'd also like to thank Prof. Hall for sharing all the articles with me and for his input in the presentation. The last four slides contain all the references that I used for the information found in the presentation. Thank you.